you know, looking back on it, one of them said, you know, memorably, you know, all we wanted to do for eight years was cause a popular uprising. And then we did, and it was awful. <laughs> Why do so many left-wing protest movements seem to end up with the exact opposite of what they asked for? From the Arab Spring to the Free Fairs movement in Sao Paulo, people poured out in their thousands onto the streets in order to transform society. And indeed, the system around them did change, but often not in the way that they thought, and more often than not, for the worse. So what are the weaknesses in these movements which led to their eventual failure, and how could they possibly be strengthened? I'm joined by Vincent Bevins, journalist and author, to discuss just that in his book, If We Burn. I was talking about this with James Butler recently, because we yeah. were both talking about how our politics have changed from right. when we first met each other. Right. And how both of us feel about the state is really different from where we were 10 years ago. Right. And for both of us, climate change was really central to it. And I was like, look, I just don't know if, you know, democracy is compatible with the pace of change which is needed in order to de decarbonize very quickly. And sure, mm. I don't want to live in authoritarian China. That doesn't seem attractive to me. Yeah. But they built a lot of high-speed rail. Uh, I think global democracy is compatible with it, right? But that would be states. Like mm -hmm. if you had an actual decision-making mechanism by which all of the states of the world came to a decision as to whether or not to solve climate change together, democracy might lead to the right, lead to the right outcome. But it would be states that would have to do it. Like, it's not going to be sort of like the perfect riot that erupts in Paris and then the whole world becomes the riot that's going to, like, change the industrial economy into a more green-friendly industrial economy. It'd have to be states that do it. But does that mean jettisoning that kind of utopian edge of communist thinking where you're talking about maximum democracy at every level of life from your a home to your local community, to your region, to your state, to the world, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of just have to go, no, we're not going to have that. Well, I think that the, I mean, the, the, the properly communist position usually on that question is that you do not jettison it, but it's be, it's something you work towards, right? But then the, the problem it's has been- It's jammed tomorrow. The problem, the problem has been for many like actual existing regimes that they put it off forever, right? But that has been traditionally the answer is that you do not jettison that, the dream. But again, I would go back to the, the you know, democracy everywhere is not the same thing as having to be managing everything on your own like the, a division of labor because like in the in the most extreme moments of horizontalist thinking in the 2010s and including in the in the book the, in the case of the movement Passi Libre in Brazil even like a division of labor would be anti-democratic even saying oh well you're good at talking or you're good at you know organizing like routes or you're good at helping the wounded that would have been considered uh, anti-democratic and I don't think and I think that idea that management is required for every single individual in order for someone to be a democratic doesn't make a lot of sense, at least in the context of what we saw in the 2010s. Well, this is going to be something we loop back to, but okay. Vincent Bevins, welcome to Downstream. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you truly. So it was really hard to pick a question to open with because the book spans so many different contexts. It is basically trying to understand why protest movements failed and what's common to the very few that succeed or have some partial successes. Um, and so I guess the thing that I wanted to kick off with was, um, what was your first experience of political failure? And did that inform this project at all? Well, certainly my experience in Brazil in 2013 shaped the way that I viewed the rest of the decade that followed. And then it began to lead me to look at the other mass protest explosions that happened before that, before 2013, which I think shaped the ways that media interpreted what was happening in Brazil. So there was a moment that I had, like many other people in the book had, where there was a protest, a set of protests in Sao Paulo, where I was working as a foreign correspondent, organized by leftists and anarchists. Um, after a police crackdown, there is a outpouring of support in society. So you and, got like tear gassed and stuff in Sao Paulo. Yeah, I got tear gassed. Other journalists were got uh, the wor a worse type of repression. I wasn't one of the journalists that like went viral for being repressed. But other journalists in Brazil's mainstream media, and this really matters a lot for the shift in media coverage that we saw that leads to the out uh, outpouring of support in the country. Um, 
the other journalists that got hit uh, um, were in a position where the mainstream media in Brazil that had been saying this is a, a you know a group of punks and anarchists that we need to clear off the streets they changed their position to this is a great thing this is a this is a patriotic uprising in defense of something in defense of the the right to defend something and the, the you know protest for protest's sake almost but then i had this experience and many other people had in the book that the subsequent outpouring of millions of millions of people into the streets when sort of it seemed like the whole country was behind this thing that had been organized in defense of lower transportation costs, in defense of, broadly speaking, social democratic goals. It felt like everything was happening. It felt like this could only deliver some kind of change along the lines that the original organizers had been asking for. That's not what happened at all. Um, different people came to the streets with a different idea of what the protest was. Um, I don't want to go all the way into the ways that this twisted and turned at this moment in this first in this first question, but long story short, uh, within a week, what we would now recognize as the beginning of a far right movement in Brazil violently expels the original left wing parties that were behind putting these protests together and um, movements are born in the streets on that day, uh, June 17th, 2013, that helped to eventually remove a democratically elected president Dilma Rousseff, uh, put Lula in jail and elect Jair Bolsonaro, the most extreme right <laughs> Uh, elected president, I think, in the world at the time. So from as a result of this in, in, in just wildly euphoric moment where it felt like it was all happening, everything was possible, everything was, the whole country was coming behind what seemed to be and were intended to be social democratic, if not radically left-wing goals by the, uh, in the eyes of the original organizers, led to the exact opposite. So uh, me, uh, in my case, and in the case of many, many other people that lived through this in Brazil, this led us to one, absolutely experienced political failure, but to look around as to what, how could that happen? And then when other mass protests around the world started to uh, continue to explode elsewhere, to really pay attention and, and try to understand what was going on. There's a conventional understanding of why left-wing protest movements fail. And I think that if you asked somebody who worked for The Times or the BBC, they'd say, well, the problem is, is that they're too left-wing. Mm -hmm. They're too left wing, they're too disconnected from where the majority of people are at. And that means there's a kind of right wing backlash, which operates as a sort of course correction. Mm -hmm. It's because these people are too disconnected mm -hmm. from where, you know, the median citizen is at. Don't really feel that that's your thesis in the book, that yours is something else. Well, that I think is what happened very often throughout history. I mean, I protested the Iraq war in 2003. And what happened at that point, it was a huge outpouring of opposition to the invasion of and destruction of that country. But what you can do as a government is simply ignore it. And that's what happened, I think, in 2003. And I think very often in history, um, we are not surprised to see that the people in power choose to see whatever outpouring of sentiment on the streets as a minority that we already knew about, we're going to ignore them. What is very strange about what I call the mass protest decade, the, the period of from 2010 to 2020. And just to summarize, I tried to write a history of the world in that decade built around mass protests, treating the history of the world in that period as if the most important thing that happened was unexpected uh, mass protests and their unintended consequences. What happens in that decade is not that they are fringe elements uh, that are ignored by elites, is that in many, many cases, they become so big that they actually unseat or fundamentally destabilize existing elites or existing governments. So many quote unquote normal people, and this becomes important because there is no like, no, every, every person is a concrete person. Like which, which group of individuals you get in the streets always matters. But you got so many quote unquote normal people that actually this worked sometimes much, much better than anybody expected and worked to an extent that opportunities were generated that other people took advantage of. So in the strange thing in the 2010s is not, oh, nothing happened, because that's normal. It's normal if they say, well, we already knew that 1% of the population feels this way and they're gonna be very noisy, we're gonna ignore them. What happened very, very often in the 2010s, and I build the story around the protests that get big enough to do this, is that people join the streets in large enough numbers that they either dislodge or fundamentally destabilize governments around the world. So in 2003, I attended my very first protest. Yeah. I was 11 years old and yeah. I went on the protest against the Iraq war. And for that period of my 
childhood, I was going on pretty regular anti-war protests and they were very formulaic. They Mm -hmm. went from A to B, you marched, you did some chanting and nobody gave a solitary flying fuck. Like we used to bunk school on Mastigo on these protests and nobody cared. And then my first experience of going to protests where people cared about these protests Mm -hmm. and they made it into the news it was from 2010 onwards. It mm-hmm. was the student movement. It mm-hmm. was the anti-austerity movement. Right. And the Arab Spring happens slap bang in the middle of all of that. Right. And I saw firsthand that our political vocabulary for what we were doing changed. Mm-hmm. So when Milbank got smashed up, when uh, the protests at Parliament Square got violent, very violent um, with the police, there was some sort of experimental terminology being thrown around like, oh, are we doing a civic swarm? Are we doing something else? And then Tahrir Square happens. We go, this is what we're trying to emulate. Yes. We're trying to create this space in which we're making a revolution amongst ourselves and then it might spread out to other things. Mm-hmm. So how did the Arab Spring become this blueprint for leftists all over the world? And indeed, all kinds of movements indeed movements that you would not consider left wing at all. I mean, both, I think that the way that um, Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong is, I'll, I'll get to this, but the Hong Kong is an explicit copy of Occupy Wall Street, which is a copy of Tahrir Square, which is uh, inspired by Tunisia. And Hong Kong, I don't think that what you would call the, led by leftists, uh, Maidan in, in, in Ukraine also is interpreted in such a way, um, interpreted in with the lens of Tahrir Square in ways which are ultimately um, important, I think, without you know that being a, a movement that is primarily leftist. You're absolutely right, I and mean, that this moment, the incredibly inspiring, and I think um, it's easy to recognize why it was so inspiring. Scene of Tahrir Square really kind of defines a lot of the rest of the decade. A lot of the rest of the decade is about either movements intentionally trying to reproduce that, or being interpreted as if they are that. By the media and, and so we, what 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 was going on in Tower Square absolutely. that was so exciting? Yes, absolutely. So it really starts in Tunisia at the end of 2010, and in Tunisia, you get a you have an uprising which begins in the interior of the country with the self-immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi, but you get a revolution which proceeds in more or less normal terms in 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 North African. Um, uh, uh, history. Um, you do get a set of, of, of concrete actors. You have a very radical left-wing party. You have the union, which ultimately a huge uh, UGTT, which ends up acting in a, in a way which is very important. You have professional associations, which end up putting pressure on the dictator who flees. And then there is uh, a process to create a new uh, a new government. Now, in Egypt, which is you know uh, uh, not far away, but politically different enough that the original organizers of protests on January 25th in Cairo, which was an initially a protest against police brutality, like so many others in uh, the 2010s, this was this was held on police day. Um, even though that they knew that Tunisia would be inspiring to some extent for Egyptians, they did not expect to take Tahrir Square. They did not expect to even make the call for Mubarak to be overthrown. They expected, hopefully, to get some people together to protest police brutality. They knew that the inspiration of what was happening in Tunisia would be important, but they did not expect to take Takhrir Square, which they do on January 25th. And they certainly don't expect what happens on January 28th, which is that essentially that night, there is a battle with the police and the police lose. So the people that have swarmed into the streets behind the original organizers of January 25th and 28th are so massive in numbers that the police like rip off their uniforms and run away. And at this point, the Egyptian revolution That must have been so exhilarating to be a part of. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I'm speaking with some of the people that organized January 25th and January 28th. And now in the context of what's happening, the way that Tahrir Square has been taken again for the first time in a very long time because of pro-Palestine solidarity. And it was, I think it's worth mentioning, mentioning pro-Palestine solidarity that led to the creation of many of these groups in the first place. It was often support for the Second Intifada that led a lot of the, or that really created the tactic of taking Tahrir Square. But to go back to January 28th, at the moment when the police uh, flee, and as you say, like the people that I'm speaking to now that I spoke to uh, uh, for this book, they say like this was, that the day was so beautiful that I could I could relive it for the rest of my life. Even knowing how badly it turns out mm. in, in, in Two, two years later, I could relive every moment for the rest of my life. It was the most alive I've ever felt. We were making history. We were crossing, we, we were pushing across the bridge and with every push of our bodies, we were pushing history forward. 
Um, Do you have any moments of being at a protest where you felt like that? It's also a case of a bridge in in Brazil in 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 June 2013, and I'm covering these protests as a foreign correspondent. I'm not supposed to be really a part of it, but I have friends of friends that are in the sort of anarcho punk uh, milieu that has a lot of members of the Movimento Passi Livre, and a good friend of mine is a photographer who's been covering it from the very beginning, and she's like not like given to flights of fancy. She's like not like the kind of Brazilian that you would imagine in the Carnaval sense. She's a very like dour Sao Paulo. Um, kind of indie rock kid. And when she sees the movement take the bridge, just like this is the, a huge moment back in, in Cairo in 2011, she texts me, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And then now she looks back on this, like how could I think that that must be a good thing? If I had paid attention to who's on the bridge, it would be very different. But on January 28th in, in Egypt, once the police run away, they could have done anything really. Right? They could have taken the literal centers, levers of power. They could have taken the police stations, the police stations. They could have taken the television station. They could have broadcast a revolutionary message. But they hadn't thought about that. It wouldn't have been clear who would have done it. That would have been necessarily some kind of a vanguard that didn't exist. There wouldn't have some kind of a revolutionary party that was leading this thing. And so what they do is they take the square. And what the world sees, what I saw, what so many people around the world saw, is this incredibly inspiring scene of people living together, all types of Egyptians secular, religious, communist, lesbian, Salafist, breaking bread, all in the square, doing what is viewed by many foreign media as a kind of prefigurative horizontalist. What does uh, this prefigurative mean? Prefigurative would be a movement which seeks to prefigure in its current uh, in its current configuration the world that it wants to see in the future. Um, so, so basically, it's like we've got to live the values that we're trying to bring into the world. We've got to make it happen in how we organize ourselves and how we treat each other and everything that we do internally has to mimic what our ultimate our ultimate goal is externally. Yeah, what we're doing now is not only going to show you what the world could be like, what the world will be like when this movement wins, but by doing it now, it makes it more likely, it somehow makes it uh, um, either inevitable or more likely that this will be the state of affairs afterwards. And in the book, I try to trace not only the ways in which protest becomes the natural response to human injustice, because this is a new thing. It only comes around in the middle of the 20th century. I also try to trace intellectually and ideologically all the types of elements, all of the elements that go into a particular recipe of protest that becomes really visible to the world with Tahrir Square. Before we get to that, yeah. we're in Tahrir Square. Yeah. Everyone's breaking bread. It's the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Um, yeah. It's being broadcast everywhere. Right. What, what happens next? And it is undeniably incredibly um, inspiring. Um, and it is seen, and there's, you know, Jack Schenker, who's a, who's a Guardian correspondent, who was one, someone that like really understood what was happening at the time. He writes a really good book later that, you know, he, he says that like, even if this wasn't exactly the ways that necessarily the Egyptians would have liked to organize this revolution, which has not been planned, those elements, the leaderlessness, the structurelessness, the prefigurative nature of the of Tahrir Square was something that media really latched on upon, especially in the West, to say, oh, what they really liked to say very often was this is the fall of the Berlin Wall, but in North Africa. This is the same thing that we believe to be happening at the end of the Soviet Union, which was, you know, not really the, the real story if you ask people that lived through it in much of the post-Soviet world. But this is now happening the same thing. The same thing is now happening in North Africa. Was that a reflection of an urge amongst establishment media types in the West to fit it into a story that they already had in their mind about the end of history, the death of ideological difference, everyone's going to be a Western liberal democracy if you just give them enough Facebook? Yes, I think so. And I think that what happens across the decade, and I'm guilty of this, this is something, a strange sort of world historical task, which is thrust upon people like me when we're not prepared for it and we should not be given it is you're asked to interpret this kind of quite difficult to understand, if not sort of fundamentally illegible explosion of humanity. And you're asked to interpret it and create content out of it for your viewers or readers back in the West within like 60 seconds. And often in this case, especially people that sort of show up from CNN and don't know anything about Egypt, will fill that content, that sort of need for an explanation with whatever's already existing in their deep ideological assumptions, like whatever they already sort of want to see or think they're going to see or what can be said that will make it look good. And this is absolutely what happens in Brazil, which causes the strange flip is that when Brazilian media have to decide 
why it is that this is a good thing, even though yesterday they were saying we need to crack these kids' skulls, they reached into their own sort of ideological toolbox to be like, well, maybe it's anti-corruption, maybe it's anti this workers' party government. So I think that, yes, across the decade, but definitely in Tahrir Square, there was, I think I use the term elective affinity between the deep ideological assumptions on the, uh, uh, the deep ideological assumptions held by the loudest media in the world, often Western corporate media, the, the outlet, the kind of outlets that I've always worked for, and the elements in the square that may have shared those assumptions. Because there were people that were like this. There were sort of people that were, that believed in the prefigure of horizontal nature of the uprising, but many, many, many others did not. But this very, very inspiring um, scene, which ultimately leads to the military seizing power and promising to put on elections. So in a very, very narrow sense, a military coup, but one which could be progressive in comparison to the previous regime if they did indeed put on democratic elections. This gets sort of copied and pasted around the world um, in very, very different national and political contexts. Occupy Wall Street is Ad Busters magazine saying, sending out, I think it's a newsletter and email to its subscribers, we need to do a Tahrir Square here in New York. And again, that was a really inspiring thing, but the ultimate outcome of it, essentially the military seizing power, is probably something you would not want in the US context, no matter how much you disliked Barack Obama or the, 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 the bailout of Wall Street. And then this sort of inspiring spectacle, and it is inspiring, I'm not trying to minimize that, gets reproduced even after the original uprising in Egypt does not go well, even after the Sisi coup in 2013 installs a dictator, which is, I think, now recognized to be more oppressive than the original Mubarak regime that it replaced. You still get, in 2014, um, students in Hong Kong trying to reproduce Occupy Wall Street, which was which is a reproduction of Egypt, after the original thing had been proved not to su be successful. And then in Brazil in 2013, as in other cases in the sort of second wave of protests in this mass protest decade, I think things would have not gone the same in Ukraine, uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, in Turkey, if the media had not viewed this as another kind of Berlin Wall slash Tahrir Square, the people coming to the streets asking for the same thing. I mean, in, in terms of that impact of... Tahrir Square on on all of us because I remember it really really well. Right. It was shaping what we were saying, how we thought about ourselves, and it wasn't just um, in New York and in London. The Gezi Park protests right. in Istanbul right. was self consciously modelling itself in some aspects of Tahrir Square as well. Mm -hmm. People people felt this really deeply. Do you think that that was just a victory of sentiment over strategy that we saw the inspirational footage we felt profoundly moved by it mm -hmm. there's a romance to right. it as well there is a romance to being on a protest and pushing forward or right. finally breaking into a building that mm -hmm. you're not supposed to be in and wanting that thrill mm -hmm. i think that social media who's i think that social media and social media's influence i think is not is often over, overstated in the in what i call the mass protest decade but it's part of what happens right social media changes things a little bit and you know all of the um episodes that i choose are chosen because they become large enough to actually destabilize or overthrow a government and for that to happen you have to have multiple causes you have to have a lot of things coming together between you know the concrete decimation of of the economic system people feeling that the, a, a certain government needs to go. But I think social media is one of the things that gets you over the line in these in these important cases. And I think that social media does two things, maybe three things, let's see how I go, uh, <laughs> is that it allows for a transfer of solidarity immediately, which is really inspiring and powerful. And I think there's no reason to question. I think it's fantastic that people see other people around the world fighting for kind of the same thing. They're allowed to send messages back and forth and say, we're with you, we support you, how can we help? And in Brazil, I do get this from Turkey. Like after I'm tear gassed, very strangely, I post on Twitter that I'm tear gassed and then it goes viral in Turkey because the people in Sao Paulo were chanting about Turkey and then I get people in Turkey sending me signs from Gezi Park um, for the next days, like saying we're with the people of Sao Paulo. So I think the transfer of solidarity is fantastic. But you also got this kind of a slippage into the transfer of tactics and tactics that are reproduced without a serious analysis of how they fit into a larger strategy. Or as I said, tactics that are very like taken from one context to into one, which is very, very different. So now 
by 2013 in Brazil, and we've already sort of, it's good that we've already explained what happened in, in, in Egypt, you get the foreign media showing up and being like, it's the Brazilian spring, right? The people are rising up against their government. But Brazil is not governed at this point by a dictator who's been in power for decades. They've got Dilma Rousseff. They have a very popular social democratic president who's been elected with an overwhelming majority of the votes, who came up from a struggle uh, against the dictatorship herself, who probably wants as much as anybody else in the country to lower the price of transportation. Indeed, she has put pressure on uh, then mayor Fernando Haddad to delay the, the rise in the price of the bus fare. And so you get this very strange situation in which after the explosion, after the crackdown, which causes the media flip, which causes lots of regular people to come to the streets with their own idea of what the, the streets are asking for, neither the original organizers of the, the protest, the Movimento Passi Livre, nor the mayor of Sao Paulo, Fernando Haddad, or the president, Dilma Rousseff, know what to do with this. Like, it's being directed at them, I think. They think, but they want to respond to it. They want to give the people what they're asking for. I mean, like, how is Dilma Rousseff making sense of it? Are there people coming to her with a list of demands? Or no. is she just like seeing the footage and being like, what do you want from me? Well, what I what we found out later, and I interviewed her in 2016, but I got this detail, which I thought was quite fascinating um, from someone that worked with her at the time. She really wanted to understand what the streets were asking for. Because after the what the original organizers was called the dilution of, of the protest because they just wanted it to be all about the cost of transportation. But they were so dogmatically horizontalist that they were never going to direct anything and they sort of did not want to take a leadership position um, in, in, in relationship to the streets. And so the streets just get filled with every kind of demand. Everyone is sort of invited to bring their own demand to the streets. And so what she does is she it's sits- It's like a potluck. It is like a carnival of, it's a political carnival. Everyone's invited to think about what they don't like and bring it to the streets, which I think you know can be a great thing if it's understood as that. But so what she does is she sits in her office and she watches Global News, one of the main- television channels, which is responsible for the flip in the first place. And she turns off the sound because she doesn't want her experience of watching the streets to be mediated by the journalist. She just wants to like watch what the streets are saying. She wants to just watch the signs. But of course, like that is only the particular slice of the streets that has been chosen for reproduction by Globo News. She can't be out in the streets like I am. And I'm seeing like day to day, I know that I'm seeing different things than she is because I know that what Globo News is putting on TV is different than what I'm seeing in the streets. And also it's happening- So what in... were those differences between what you were seeing and what Global News is putting out? So on June 13th, which is the day of the crackdown, the day that we wake up to the, the, the press asking for brutal repression, everyone on the streets is recognizably a leftist, you know, uh, either they are anarchists or they're in small left-wing parties, Trotskyist parties, like, uh, you know, splinter uh, groups that are somehow supportive of the, the government, but not from the left. By it would be a section of the human menagerie that many of our viewers would be quite familiar with. Exactly. I, like, I, I try to describe it in, in the book, but it's like, it's it would be very, I think, familiar to people that grew up on the left in, in any country Nose around the world. Nose piercings and paper sales. I, yeah, put that their you know, clothes are a little bit ragged, but it's not because of uh, economic conditions. It's just like, it's these are, these are university or post-university students that are committed activists. They know each other. Um, and, but then after the crackdown on the 17th, four days later, you get a huge influx of people wearing Brazilian football jerseys. These people are wider, they're bigger, they're often men that clearly go to the gym. And on June 17th, I see that these, these people are a small minority, but they really make their presence known because they get into fights with the original punks and leftists. Because the original punks and leftists see these kind of bulky guys with flags and sort of broad nationalist sy symbols and they see it as their role as to like call these guys in rather than call them out. They're kind of like, hey guys, you know, at a protest like this, if you bring nationalist symbols and just sort of chant, I love Brazil, that can easily lead to fascism. Like the way that this protest is structured is like that. They're trying to like explain to them. And the new guys are like, well, fuck you. I don't care about you. Fuck you. I hate you, punk left kids. I'm not listening to your lectures. And does this kind of foreshadow the way like Bolsonaro was draping himself in 
the kit of the these Brazilian people, team. Absolutely. These people are now would be very, very easily recognizable as like sort of proto Bolsonaristas, the beginning of the Bolsonaro movement. Even though on June 17th, these, these people are a small minority, the people that come like with, you know, like lighter skinned, more middle class Brazilians that have sort of Brazilian flag face paint. Mm-hmm. I only see them a little bit in the streets. That's what's on TV. When I get back to my house later that night, finally, after hours and hours and hours of marching, because the police just kind of let us march. And there's this feeling like, oh, well, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. We're just walking around. When I get back and I look on TV, the scenes that are chosen by the center-right oligarch-owned media that have now chosen to say that this is a good thing rather than a bad thing tends to be of more like photogenic, middle-class, photogenic, of course, like according to the beauty standards of the Brazilian ruling class, uh, middle class, like patriotic protesters. And I knew that that wasn't, that was only a small group of people. But then by June 19th, by June 20th, they like are the mass of people and they literally violently expel the original protesters. And so this is a strange dynamic, which I think is at the core of protesting from the very beginning. Like you don't see protests before mass media. Protest as the, as a possible or even ultimately seeming natural way to respond to injustice or perceived injustice comes about because of media. These are fundamentally always actions which interact with media in some way or another. People are always, the vast majority of people that find out about a protest are not going to see it with their own eyes. Like the human body can only see what's right in front of it. Most people are going to find out about a protest through media. Uh, Most effective protests are going to get their message out because of media reproduction. But in this decade, I find in many, many cases, media mistakes or media choices, not only change the way that protests are understood elsewhere, they change the concrete configuration of forces on the streets. They change what the protest is. Often from morning to night, from day to day, um, media, media representation changes the actual thing. And this happens across across the decade, I think. I mean, we've been using this word a lot. It might be worth explaining what it means. What is horizontalism? Yeah. And so, so this is a thing that I try not to spend too much time on in the book because it can be theoretical. You're going to get like I, 50 anarchists beefing you about no, it. No, but I think for, 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 I think your viewers are people that probably uh, are interested, like know more or less and have more interest in the actual content of the term. So it comes out of Argentina in 2001. In, in Argentina in 2001, there is a total government collapse as a result of negotiations with the IMF. All existing representative structures collapse in Argentina in 2001. And this is one of the more Um, famous uprisings against global neoliberalism. But what happens in this total vacuum of power and vacuum of structure is people form assemblies that are horizontally organized. It's because, and I interviewed a lot of the people that were there at the time, uh, occupying factories, working for Indie Media Argentina. Indie Media is a big part of the diffusion of this particular ideology. They say that they entered this vacuum and they acted in this way because there was just simply no structure that could work at all. So they had assemblies in which everyone was equal. Everyone could show up. No one was in or out. If you just came, you were in. Uh, all votes were equal. And then they would just have um, equal decision-making power over whatever decision that was they... Was it wavy hands consensus? Because that's what I'm most familiar with. So this means yes. <laughs> this means no. This means concrete proposal. This means block. It was never, ever used. It was considered very violent. You, you weren't allowed to block it? Was yeah, that, no one was allowed to block. I was like, what's block? the point of te- teaching me the block gesture if I can never use it? Yeah, sometimes the threat of the block can be. But it, this certainly grew into. And that process is another that I traced through the book. So after this sort of co- concrete horizontality, and this is an interesting like slippage again that happens, because this was called horizontalidad in Spanish, like concrete horizontality. But then a book comes out written by an anarchist theorist in 2006 in the United States called Horizontalism. And this represents the moment, I think, when people start to adopt this, not only as like something that happens in a power vacuum, which is what the the case of Argentina was, but a morally and tactically privileged way to organize for social change. So certainly this influenced Occupy Wall Street. But the Movimento Passi Livre, this group of punks and anarchists that I described as starting the the protest in Brazil in June 2013, um, they were formed as an explicitly horizontal group. And what this meant for them was that not only would would there be no leaders, no levels, everyone was at the same level in the group, that's the horizontal, that's the literal horizontal bit, that there would be no division of labor, like every job would be rotated within the group. So there would be no one that would be the spokesperson because that person could be seen as the leader uh, by by media or the state. No one would be in charge of everything, anything as a specific individual. And every decision should be 
uh, reached through consensus. And in the months up to the organization of the protest, this often meant 12, 14 hour, 16 hour meetings to arrive at full consensus. And in that moment, they could do it. They had the time they were dedicated, these 30, 40 people. They were willing to spend 14 hours getting to a point where everyone was on the same page. Um, but then when the explosion comes- Did people comes, even get on the same page through that I think that process? eventually these people did. They had known each other well enough for eight years. These people, this small group, they did eventually. They did eventually. They did not when the unexpected explosion came. When the unexpected explosion came, the thing that they had thought that they had wanted for years, because they formed in 2005, the Movimento Passi Libre, and they really did come out of indie media, and they were really inspired by Argentina, which is, of course, just across the border, but they also came up in this sort of like US-inflected media structure. They worked for the, the local offices of indie media. They had been working for eight years to cause a popular uprising. They had thought that that's what they always wanted, that that's all they wanted. But when it comes, it's very unexpected. And, you know, looking back on it, one of them said, you know, memorably, you know, all we wanted to do for eight years was cause a popular uprising. And then we did. And it was awful. <laughs> and in this moment where they had to decide what to do, how to change tactics quickly, they, that this, the 14 hour meeting does no, no longer does work. Was there a sense amongst this group of like horizontalist anarchists who'd been working together for a long time? Did they have an image in their head of what things going well would be? They, this is another very interesting um, point that was made to me. Over these six months where they had planned for every single element of the protests, they had planned down to the day when they were going to take which street, when the likely police repression would come, which newspaper they want to be on the front of on which day. They planned everything down to the minute in their, in their quest to overturn the bus fare rise. After that, they had planned for nothing. They had the day afterwards, they had not thought about it at all. And this is something that people in Egypt told me, like, well, we just thought that Mubarak being out, that would be it. And that then the good things, right? Um, and all uh, we had to do was kill the king. Yeah. Well, if, you know, I think maybe in like a long time ago, that made more sense. Like, you know, when there really was just one bad king and you just needed a new guy to go in there, it was, it was pretty simple. It was pretty simple. But contemporary society, so certainly the like, imperfect but real democracy that Brazil had in 2013. It was very difficult to figure out what to do. And so two things happened that are related to the question of horizontalism in practice in Brazil. One, they have perhaps an hour, perhaps six hours to change, to decide how to change tactics to deal with this new situation. They cannot decide. I mean, there are many, many ways that this could go and they're tired, they're beaten down from organizing, you know, I think sort of heroic battles in the streets that people um, got behind and they just can't figure out what to do next. They ultimately decide on doing nothing. And then also, because they are rightfully seen as the people that put together this movement that got millions of Brazilians onto the streets for the first time since really the fall of the dictatorship, since at least 1992, thousands of people from around the country try to join their group, but they don't know how to deal with this because in horizontalism, if they were to create a sort of two-tiered structure where like, well, we'll do the 14-hour meetings, but everybody else can just come some of the time, that was called a Leninist deviation by somebody in the, you know, somebody, remember, somebody did block. I remember vanguardism being used yeah. as a very derogatory term. Yeah, somebody blocked. Somebody said that's Leninism uh, because, you know, that was the whole point of the thing was that you can't have two levels. But then also if you have a group of, you know, 40 to 70 or 80 like dedicated militants that have known each other for eight years and then you let in a thousand people, well then now it's just whatever the thousand people think it is. It's no longer the Movimento Passi Libre, it's just whatever these people saw on TV and think that they're joining. Well, that's kind of interesting because in the early chapters of the book, one of the things that you talk about is this relationship between punk and anarchism. Right. And that sure, it sort of pops up because you know, Malcolm McLaren is like, oh, I want to come up with something sh shocking so yeah. that I can sell my clothes. Yeah. So let's and just like this he, word. And whatever. he does communism first and it's too shocking. And so he switches to anarchism. Yeah, it's like oh, communism actually means something yeah, in this he, context. He makes so. the New York Dolls communists. And then memorably the New York Dolls, like in one of their like biographies or autobiographies, they say, in the United States, you can be, be gay, you can be a drug addict, you can be a drag queen, you can't be a communist. He had gone too far. And so his next band, Sex Pistols, he makes him anarchist. Well, and so like there's this connection between punk and anarchism and i wonder if maybe this is something that um i don't know resonates for you in in the kind of reportage that you were doing but sometimes when i interact with anarchists i feel that it functions more like a subculture than it does a political movement mm -hmm. 
And so when there are these anxieties of like, but everyone wants to do this now. And it's like, but you said you believed in popular politics right. and now, now it's popular. Yeah. Um, there is that feeling of like, but I liked it when only me and my friends went to this club. Yeah. Like, no, you, you, you're too new. Your clothes are too mm -hmm. new. You're not doing it right. Well, I think there is two things there. I think there is the real, I mean, I think that most anarchists by this point knew about the dangers of the famous the lifestyle anarchism, I think is the famous book that, you know, a lot of anarchists would have known about this particular type of risk. And certainly MPL would have been dedicated to avoiding it. They did want the working class people of Brazil to get behind them. They did want to cause a popular revolt. They weren't going to be, you know, uh, saying like, no, no, this is our club, uh, you know, stay away. But it was the wrong people that came. And this was the thing that they hadn't thought about um, when privileging the street revolt in the center of Sao Paulo, because as comes up in many, many other of, of these cases across the, the mass protest decade, if you're in the center of Sao Paulo, number one, you're not dealing with the working class Brazilians that they wanted to reach initially. So one of the decisions they do make is to go back into the periphery into like sort of what would be the Sao Paulo version of favelas. But because they had been organizing the center of Sao Paulo, who comes in their language would be kind of like petty bourgeois common sense reactionaries. That's who lives there, number one. And number two- Love me dog, love me missus, hey <laughs> pedo, simple as. Or like, yeah, or like, you know, let's throw them all out, let's chuck them all out, they're all clowns. And yeah. this is like, they're horrified to see, and this is another like weird slippage that happens in the book. They're a party, they do not, they're like extra, parliament, extra parliamentary. They do not have a party, they do not believe, they do not do party politics, but they're not against the existence of parties. They know that the state is there and ultimately they want the state to deliver this these um, benefits to the Brazilian people. But there's this, there's this weird slippage from being a party to just anti-political in general. And anti-politics really wins the streets. But the other point I was trying to make, uh, but before I forgot about it, is that when you have like extended street confrontations with the police, who tends to win is like football ultras. Well, I wanted to ask <laughs> you about this because football ultras pop up throughout the yeah. book. And if you're someone who loves football right. and occasionally been on the sidelines of a football scuff, I was like, ah, the football ultras yeah. here again. So they pop up for you in Ukraine in the uh, Maidan protests. They pop up again in Gezi Park and here they are in Sao Paulo. So one, why do football ultras keep popping up yeah. in protest movements? And two, do they play out in different ways in different contexts? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a, this is a, like one of the things that you could have never planned for, right? But very strangely, whether or not the particular ultras of the of the clubs that are closest to the capital tend to be left or right wing all, like ends up really mattering for the outcome of some of these uprisings. So like in Brazil, like the biggest, roughest club in Sao Paulo, Corinthians, is pro Lula, pro democracy. So they're not going to be like a fascist threat. If anything, ultimately, like fast, you know, now go to 2022, they cleared the Bolsonaristas off the roads when they tried to organize a coup attempt and shut down the highways. But, and then in Turkey, you had Besiktas and mm. Fenerbahce fans that they came to Gezi Park with like the A in, the A turned to the anarchist A and the C turned to the hammer and sickle. And they come out like on, with a left understanding of Gezi Park. In Ukraine, very famously, many of the people that come to be right sector or the, eventually the battalions fighting in the east of the country are right-wing football ultras. They, that is, they are organized and dedicated to not only fighting the cops after the game, but to a right-wing uh, vision for the country. And why do they come up? It's because if you have extended street occupations that involve intermittent clashes with the police, the people that do the best at this are the people <laughs> that have been doing it for the last 10 years, the people that do it every weekend, the people that, and the people that are like, well organized with like, you know, maybe just like, not like a proper mass organization, but you know, you got like what you could call like a cell of like 10 mates that can like, that know how to fight together. And they like rise to the top in many, in many uh, situations. Um, in London in 2011, there was a massive street protest on March the 26th. And I was there with my friend and we got kettled. And as we were trying to break out with the kettle, a police officer brought his shield down on my friend's head and right. just like exploded, just blood everywhere. And um, some random anarchos with green and black cross came over and bandaged up my friend's head. And then I was like, I should probably try and work out if you've got concussion or something. Yeah. I don't really know how to do this. So I like dragged him into a side street where we then ran into a load of 
football hooligans who right. very expertly checked if he had concussion. There you go. He didn't. And then signed the bandage into City Firm. But I mean, I think like coming back to the question of like um, a movement which is based on confrontations with the police. One of the things which I found is that I thought that I was really big and quite good at fighting. Yeah. Um, don't laugh at me. No. I'm maybe five foot two, but I actually have like no, I quite, think that, yeah, yeah, quite strong legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very good at kicking. Yes. Um, and I thought I was really good at that until like suddenly you're just getting like thrown around like a rag doll by like, you know, a member of the TSG. Mm-hmm. And then the only people who seem to be good at not getting thrown around are football hooligans. Mm-hmm. And do you think that, you know, these street movements and how they play out, particularly with anarchists, is that people who are anarchists tend to have a very romantic notion of violence and maybe an overestimation of their capacity for it and then it's happening and then like oh shit i'm actually i don't have a great capacity for violence at in, all. in the case of brazil again these are the people that were i mean they very like smart anarchists and leftists they'd thought a lot about their their philosophy of of struggle they believed really in direct action and they believed for example that you know if you wanted to lower the price of transportation or make it ultimately because their goal was the full decommodification of transportation in brazil their goal it was like it's free fair movement movement passe livre they wanted there to be no costs so they would block the turnstile so that people couldn't pay they believed in this kind of this is a prefigurative idea like the idea that well now for 6 hours we're showing the world that like what it could be like to to um to not have to pay and also the the conflict with like the most visible and violent um, agents of state repression was just like baked into this idea of what direction direct action would always mean. And I asked some of them much much later. I said, you know, was your idea of struggle sort of more about the conflict in the streets than the ultimate goal? Like, if you could have, you know, think back to before June 2013. If there was another route you could have taken to getting the bus fare lowered that did not involve direct action in street battles, would you have taken it? They're like, absolutely not. We thought that this was the right way to do it. And maybe we just kind of wanted to do it that way. They had they had chosen indeed transportation um, as the, the core cause of their group because of a sort of, I think, inspiring to them, but certainly um, very important uprising that happened elsewhere in Brazil. And so when it came to like extended street contestation when it came to like a long-term battle over who can get the most people into downtown sao paulo there was less of them than there were the petty bourgeois you know common sense anti-political reactionaries and they got thrown out and this was a you know this was a very very difficult scene to watch because it was only Eight days after the this moment where my friend Juliana texts me and says it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Eight days later, it's members of PSOL, which is one of the political parties in Brazil, which has a lot of international partners um, in, in like Western Europe and North America. And they're just like, don't know what to do. They've been thrown, literally thrown out by these bigger guys. And like, that's the type of popular revolt they got where these men were just better at street violence than they were. And then ultimately then, you know, as I said, the moment's possible, they decided to go into the the outskirts of the city because they, you know, they decided that this is not really the place to be. But for years and years and years, they like, I also deep believed it deep down in my bones that like, if everybody came out for the thing that was originally good, it must only be good. And what this book is built around is the strange cases of when it's not only nothing happens, but the opposite happens, something bad happens. I mean, one one of the chapters you are interviewing this guy who's like a young leftist in Ukraine who was initially working at a fast food shop. Trying to unionize it, yeah. Yeah, trying to unionize it. And then he sees the sort of um, beginnings of like the Maidan protest begin to kick up. And he's like, this is just a bunch of libs. You want to join the EU? I've right. got no real common cause with you. And then he sees the repression and goes, okay, Europe, Europe stands in for this bigger idea. Right. And long story short, he gets involved, says to the rest of the left, and then along come the neo-Nazis, along come the really, really right-wing fascistic elements of the football ultras. What do the leftists do then? So you're in this moment where you can see the street movement that you have participated in being taken over mm-hmm. or, you know, heavily, um, I don't want really to use too loaded a word, but the only one that's coming to my mind is infested, like infested with fascists. And... What do you do? Do you go, okay, well, this is a weird and uneasy coalition. Let's right. see where that goes. Or do you try and contest it? Do you try and fight for it? Or do you try and leave and do something else? Like so how, how does the All three things respond? that you just said are things that leftists did in Ukraine. So all three <laughs> options. So that particular um, 
individual that you described is one that gets threatened by, with violence by the far right, which is a beginning to establish hegemony, not over the square itself, but hegemony over the armed self-defense forces in the square. So this is an important distinction that at the beginning, it is kind of a small group of Western facing um, liberals, even maybe even you might call them neoliberals, that uh, are protesting in support of an association agreement with the European Union that does not have majority support. Only 40% of Ukrainians want uh, this association agreement at the beginning. And then you have a police crackdown, which causes a huge amount of people to pour into the square, regular people, quote unquote, regular people, and leftists like uh, RTM, who is the character that you're describing, and other types of leftists that decide, well, if this is happening, we're going to make it about an idea of Europe, which is inclusion, which is feminist, which is social democratic. They slowly realize that they're losing the fight to, 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 to push Maidan in this direction. So he decides to, even though he's been violently expelled by the right from the square and, and, and threatened in many moments, during our interviews in 2021 in, in Kyiv, he is attacked once more by the far right. Like the day that I'm supposed to meet him, he's attacked. But yet he decides to stay with whatever this very imperfect post-Maidan Ukraine is. Other leftists who were in Maidan trying to push things in their direction from the beginning leave. They go to the east or they just say they either say, well, this is not my thing at all. I'm leaving or some of them. One group very notably becomes really uh, um, active in the anti-Maidan protests, which end up uh, being infiltrated by Russia and, uh, uh, you know, in a strange way, they're not the same thing, end up sort of dissipating into what becomes the republics in the, in the Donbass. So all three things that you've described do happen. People just decide to like stay with it. Leftists are like, well, we lost the battle and we're actually being actually beat up quite often, but it makes more sense to stay in this very imperfect post nine order than to leave it. Others go away and others flip sides. Others join the anti-Maidan movement, which um, becomes, uh, which has two phases. One, which is kind of uh, uh, um, put on as a show by the Yanukovych government in another way, which comes later, which has a lot more grassroots support in response to the change of government in February. I mean, I want to move on to questions of strategy, but like, before I do, there are lots of people who would say, you can't be a journalist, you can't be a foreign correspondent, you can't do reportage and also write something which is um, got any kind of strategic advisory element for right. a political group or movement. You can't do both those things at the same time. Right. Did you ever feel that there was a tension between journalism and some of those strategic prescriptions or did it feel perfectly natural. Well, I hope that I'm not giving any prescriptions myself. I hope that what I'm doing- There's a bit in there. <laughs> yeah, but I hope that I'm allowing people to tell readers what they learned over the over the course of their, over the course of the decade. No, is that not, is that not how it comes across? Oh my God, this is, I'm sorry, right. Cheap trick and I know it because I do it too, <laughs> right? There's obviously a perspective in absolutely, here. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a strong skepticism of horizontalism. Sure. There's a, way of telling a strategic story which is gently advisory about the need for representation some forms of hierarchy some forms of division of labor and dare i say it revisiting some of the leninist tool book mm -hmm. in order to um, make sure that the same mistake doesn't get played out again which is that the disorganized lose out to the organized and mm -hmm. sure that happens because the people who you interview tell that story and right. I think that it's very strongly evidenced by the people who who you interview. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell me that you're totally disengaged and separate from it. Well, no, I'm no engaged. I have, I have my own opinions, of course. Um, but I hope that the two things that you described, the, the reportage and the conversations about what could have what maybe went wrong and what could be done better are sort of the same project. I believe that they're the same project. I mean, it really was what I really did do was try to find 200 to 250 people around the world in 12 countries that had either helped to organize, helped to respond to, or been tasked with sort of governing these mass protest explosions, ask every single one of them what happened. And then in the cases that they were original organizers, ask them what they wish they would have done differently, what they would tell a younger uh, uh, generation, because this is what they wanted to talk about. This is why they wanted to talk to me was to say, this is what I learned. This is why there's value in having these conversations. And like a lot of them end up agreeing. And I think that if you want to like 
guess who I agree with. It's not going to be hard to guess, but like they don't all agree. And I also, you know, I hope that the people that don't end up agreeing with like the, the bigger voices feel also like they were represented more or less fairly in the, um, in, in, in those final conversations. But like the book, the like history bit is structured as history. It's really, I think it's primarily the value of the project. If there's any is to see like what happens, you know, like, and watching what happens in one country after another, how that one country learned from another, how these things affected each other, I think um, is the main thing that the book does. And then the question that I did ask these people, because these questions were asked together. What happened? What do you wish happened? What do you wish to tell people? Um, that is just the type of reportage that I think that I did. Um, I like, I, I'm very open. I mean, I put myself in the book, right? Like I'm open about the ways that I respond emotionally in some moments that I think that I make mistakes, that I sort of see things happening throughout, throughout the decade. But it's, the book is not structured as an argument, right? It's structured as a history with then people sort of turning to the camera and saying like, I wish we would have done this. Oh yeah, it's, it's definitely not um, an argument. It's certainly not a polemic, right. but I suppose I read the book and I saw an audience for it, which was made up of people who either are or want to be politically active in yeah. some way. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if you're a journalist and you're producing work, which is politically instructive mm -hmm. to people who are politically active, mm -hmm. there would be lots of people at the BBC, at the Guardian, at the Times, who would say, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, do you have a a response in your head about that kind of criticism? Sure you can. That's my, <laughs> that's my response. Sure you can, or else I wouldn't have done it. Um, yeah, no, I think that the, I do think that I sort of, I mean, it might seem like it's um, slightly disingenuous, but like it, I think there is a degree to which that I try to be, follow the rules of the ethic of sort of classic journalism to a letter. And by being sort of almost naively faithful to them, you can come up with something that is hopefully useful to people that are skeptical of those of those institutions. Like I think that at forming a set of interviews around the question, the questions of what happened and do you wish what would have happened? Because um, I mean, all history, even if you write it without asking anybody, what do you wish you would do different? What would you like to tell the reader? All history is selected for or selected around certain concerns. All journalism is selected around a certain idea of what is important. This, you know, this is one of the things that SDS, uh, one of the early members of SDS, Todd Gitlin says, is he realizes, like, slowly realizes how po powerful media is. It's like, oh, there's like a whole lot of facts and you can kind of pick <laughs> the ones that you want to tell any story. Um, and so the selection of facts, I think, at the BBC or Guardian or in my book is always driven by a particular set of concerns. I just try to be really open what mine are. Mine are, I'm structuring a history around this one strange question that I believe is important. I, hopefully the reader thinks it's important too. And then that is going to just define what puts, gets put into the history, which, you know, because there's lots of interviews I do, which I don't include, you know, because a lot of times people, it turns out that they don't really want to talk. They're sort of, it turns out they're kind of lying. It turns out that they're hiding things or other times it just doesn't fit into the larger story. So I think like any work of mainstream, like rigorous old school journalism, I try to present everyone's views like fairly to them. Like this really matters to me. Like I really don't want any one of those 225 people to be like, Hey, that's not what I meant. You that really one. screwed me over. Yeah, I, 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 this, I take this very, very seriously. And I hope that the people that all like even come down on the side that is in the minority of the of the respondents at the end of the book also say, like I'm still, you know, talking to all these people all the time, whether it's about what's happening in Brazil now or what's happening in Gaza. Um, I hope they say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I, you know, I know that a lot of my friends became Leninists, but I didn't and at least you represented what I still think. Um, correctly. And I hope that sort of that approach of just like kind of trying to lay out the facts, of course, organized a around a certain set of concerns, organized as around a certain set of questions is still kind of the same thing. It's just that I'm very open about what those questions are in the introduction. One of the things that um, I was thinking as I was reading the book was in 1972, I think, Zhu Enlai was asked, you know, what yeah. were the effects of the French Revolution? And he quipped somewhat wryly, too early to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Did you ever feel frustrated by your vantage point, which is you're still looking in historical terms at a series of events where the consequences are still unfolding? And if you'd looked at the consequences of 1968 from the vantage point of 1978, you'd probably think something very different from how it then unfolds in, mm-hmm. you know, 84, 85, 92. Um, well, there are moments where you're just like, I just wish I could step outside of my own place in time and get like the long durée view. I would love to step out my own place in time and <laughs> view things from 100 years in the future. Yeah, and that quote, I think it's apocryphal, but it's like, it's too good to like question. I, think I choose you, to believe. Yeah, I choose to believe too. Uh, there's an, like, it's like Lenin's one where he says like, there are weeks when, uh, there are decades when nothing happens and weeks when decades happen. I think also maybe you didn't say, but it's too good. <laughs> you have to include it. Um, it is much easier to write a history of something that happened in the 1960s, which is what my first book did. And I, I think it was like, then as a result, easier to construct a narrative, which is kind of a slam dunk. This is like, this is what happens. This is this horrible thing that the US and their allies did. Um, the Trying to build a global history of the 2010s is very challenging. And like, inevitably inherently will be like flawed like it will like something will come i even i say this in the uh, the epilogue i think like we will learn things about behind the scenes activities that will matter to this history i just don't have access yet like it's absolutely a difficult thing but i think that also makes it like um not ironically but i think that makes it a little more acceptable for a journalist to be involved because a lot of historians that are dealing with things 50 100 years ago don't like when journalists get involved they're like well this is our this is our <laughs> this is our territory we do archive research uh interviews are going to be flawed when they're about something this far in the past but something that happened you know to me hopefully this is something that i can add to the literature but you're 100 percent right this is is very difficult and like it's it will be in some ways for sure in 10 years it will be seen as imperfect but also like it is necessary for the way, you know, the the constant reinterpretation of the past is necessary for the way that the next 10 years will unfold. Posterity makes fools of everyone. It's yeah, a great absolutely. Equalizer. We're all going to be, well, some people end up looking really good even hundreds of years later. <laughs> um, but absolutely. But, the, but again, the reason these people sat down with me is so that, and this really powers the whole um, project. And again, it's, I, it helps to respond, I think, to that good question you asked a second ago. Um, they would not have been involved in a project like this if the idea was not that. In 10 years, many apparent failures, what appear to be failures in 2023, can be viewed in 2033 as the seeds of ultimate victories. For that vision to be possible in 2033, 2023 to 2033 must involve a process of learning and reinterpreting from the past and re reorienting tactics with goals and so on. So. To write a, a book that was purely like, I just want to know the facts, just the facts, like let's not talk about learning lessons, let's not talk about organizing for the future, would not have made the book possible. These people wouldn't have wanted to be involved. They, they want to create a world in which I'm wrong. They want to create a world in which these apparent failures turn out to be the beginnings of victories. I mean, so I want to talk about strategy because really that is what this book is about. As much as it's also about these moments of, of, of you know, huge you know, quite romantic moments of confrontation. It's about the kinds of strategies and lack of strategies that were going on at these particular times. Um, There's an account of the ways in which horizontalism fails to be organized enough to take advantage of the moments that it produces. Mm -hmm. So what are the kinds of alternatives that are available for people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really about a, a very specific package of tactics that comes together historically and ideologically that is often divorced from strategy. Sometimes it works great in a in, when inserted into a larger strategic vision. Sometimes it is divorced from that strategic vision, and this often comes um, becomes tragically clear to the participants at the moment when, like, oh my god, we've disrupted this power center, we've created a power vacuum, but we cannot fill it because we don't have the kind of movement that could fill a power vacuum. Who's filling it is now our enemies, right? Um, so this particular set of tactics, like this like repertoire of contention to use the sociological language, would be the apparently spontaneous, apparently leaderless, digitally coordinated mass protest in public squares and public spaces. So all of those elements 
come from somewhere. They don't need to go together, but they really seemed like they were supposed to all the time in the 2010s. So you can do protests that are different or you can do things that are not protests. So uh, strikes and boycotts are often proven historically to be very effective at putting pressure on elites, often more so than protests. Protests, I think, are fundamentally communicative acts. That doesn't mean that there are uh, that, that that that's not a problem, but I think understanding that um, helps us to understand that they work best when in um, dialogue with or when supported by other types of actions or by organizations that can put pressure on existing elites on the state. Um, an answer that comes out of many of the interviews at the end of the book is the creation of organizations to do what you can. You know, in accordance with your vision of the, the future you want to build, in accordance with where your actual goals are, to build organizations when it seems like nothing is happening, to build the kind of collective um, capacities for acting for action, to build the kind of collective capacities for action um, that can respond to changing circumstances, that can act in the long term. And these often work really well in concert with protests when they do happen, because I don't think the mass protest is going away. Like... Social media has made it quite easy to bring lots of people together around a particular cause or often like a particular like post, like a viral image very quickly. Um, and so like one of the answers, and this is something that I really try to do, I do try to really give to other voices at the end. Um, Rodrigo Nunes, he's a Brazilian philosopher. He's now here. He talks about an ecology of organizations, organizations that, that are not necessarily permanent vanguards, but can act in a vanguard manner in relationship to uh, other movements. And then not a lot of people get back into labor organizing. This is something that like never went away in the UK, but in like the US, this is something that a lot of people in sort of like the Bernie generation have gotten into for the first time. So let's talk about labor organizing, because something which I've been thinking about a lot is about what kind of labor organizing people are doing. And it seems that you've got a kind of generation left scenario here in the UK. You've got lots of people who were politically active during the Corbyn movement and are now are looking for something to do. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there are lots of people who go, okay, well, my job is to unionize wherever I am. But often that's not in strategic sectors, mm -hmm. right? So it's like NGOs and charities mm -hmm. or left-wing organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a smaller group of people who are saying, okay, well, actually what we should try and do is identify like choke points in capitalism mm -hmm. and all almost do the Alliance for Workers' Liberty thing of taking up jobs in strategic mm -hmm. sectors so we could do labor organizing there. I mean, in terms of like your sense of what's like strategically useful and what's worked in other contexts, what should you do? Should you organize what's close or organize what feels like it could be most disruptive to capitalism? Uh, so recognizing this is now inside of the scope of the book, but this is just like, this came up a lot because I just did a tour in the US and a lot of people wanted to, had read the book and they'd brought their own experiences, either what they had done after Bernie, what they'd after done after the George Floyd uprisings. Um, I would say that some of the most important victories in this like very like incipient, like rebirth of a labor movement in the United States had to do with the second thing that you said, going to Amazon or going to form a reform caucus within the UAW, which changes the leadership, which allows for the most one of the most important strikes in a very long time in the United States, going to strategic sectors. But I would also say that like not everybody is a full-time, <laughs> dedicated, professional revolutionary. And doing what you can in like around you is better than not doing anything. You know, like I think that like again, you can have both. Like I think that um, being very strategic has has been proven to be effective in the US context, but not everybody has to do that. And, and I think that, again, like the kind of lessons that come out of a lot of the conversations at the end of the book um, revolve around some kind of message that says, just join an organization. Like whatever it is that you care about, it doesn't have to be like a dedicated fully, a, a revolutionary party if that's not what you wanna do with your life. But like something that gets you together with other human beings that you can work collectively on building something that can act locally, nationally, internationally, whatever you think is best, is better than sort of like what we're all doing now, including myself, just like kind of sitting at home alone on the computer, getting mad at the computer, typing into the Some computer. Some of us have that as a job. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. You, you, you sort of mentioned earlier that there is a understanding of democracy in some horizontalist tendencies where everyone is a manager, right? right. Um, even in say like a more vertical or representative or hierarchical, mm -hmm organization what is a reasonable amount of strategy for lots of people to get involved in 
is it just the fact that for an efficient and effective organization that the bulk of the people participating in it aren't involved in strategic conversations? I think, so I spent the summer with the MST in Brazil, you know, the landless workers movement. So I'm doing another article that comes out after this, which is like response to a lot of the same concerns. This is what's been driving me for a long time, like organizational practices. And the MST is a very, very large, very radical, but also very pragmatic land reform organization in Brazil. And they have a hierarchy. They're proud of having a hierarchy. They're proud of having like a disciplined sector. They're having, they're proud of having cadre formation. They're proud of having different jobs for different people. And they absolutely also believe in full democracy. They believe in you know, pressure from the bottom up on the quote unquote leadership. The leadership is like 82 people that are elected every once in a while, like two per state. So you never, you don't have like, you know, like the cult of personality around like one man or something, which is often what you get in hierarchical organizations. Like gilded Homer Simpson when he's Ozymandias. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't have that. You have some people that know are sort of top intellectuals and spending a lot of time on the their occupations, they're sort of they take over unused land and then demand that the state hand it over to them. You absolutely meet people on the occupations that are like, I don't, I just want to farm. Like I like farming. I like my cabin over here. I'll do the political activities that are required of me. But my like my contribution to the movement is farming. And for the MST, that's okay. There's no requirement that all one million members of the MST participate um in like everyday decision making but they they do have you know they have processes by which they uh, elect leaders of their you know given little you know base council their little encampment and then there is there's a hierarchy but and then people that really show a lot of intellectual curiosity people that really get into theory there's like a route that they're like oh yeah well you can go to one of our our, our cadre training schools and you can um you can read like lenin and mao and of rosa luxemburg and and you know the histories of slave revolts in brazil for for years and we'll pay for that and then you can maybe take a, a role that is in the communication sector or something and i don't know what is a better way to organize a movement i think the mst has done quite well at like surviving the dark years of bolsonaro and, and also like delivering real gains for working class people but leaving that aside that type of organization where somebody is a, in the communication sector someone is a farmer and someone is doing sort of strategy strategy with relations with china does not preclude the idea that they're all equal as human beings and all have the same votes and all have the same like value as members. They just have different jobs. So I was chairing an event at TWT in Liverpool this year and the title was What is to be done? And Sorry. the speakers, Hilary Wainwright, Jamie Woodcock and Roger Hallam, who is of course the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. And the question is really one about strategy. Mm -hmm. What's the strategy and getting people involved in doing it. Roger Hallam takes the mic, he opens with, you're all fucking cunts, and repeats this multiple times. And his basic take is, you're all fucking cunts because you're not doing the bare minimum, which is acts of civil disobedience, which can get you arrested no. in the service of climate justice. And it all went completely haywire. All of the responses to it were either people going, I'm not a cunt, Roger Hallam. <laughs> um, yeah. There was a big uh, kind of id poll rebellion going on as well. And then there was a small number of people who wanted to say, okay, we get that this is kind of a bit because you want us to get involved in your thing, but what's the strategy? What's the theory of change? Right. Why this tactic? Why right. not another tactic? And it's not that Roger Hallam hasn't thought about these things. Of course he has, mm -hmm. but he stonewalled it. He was like, absolutely not. I'm not gonna be drawn into this conversation. And it seemed to me that this was a kind of strategy where there has been a strategic conversation, but it will never be contested openly because in his mind, that would make it less effective. What do you make of, I guess, this we kind of post-strategy strategy, which is, I think, happening in sections of the climate movement, where there's a small number of people who work out what to do. They invite everyone to participate in it, but there is absolutely no public contestation. Yeah, I think I, I'd, have to, I'd have to ask you what he means. Like, so he, the idea is that if it were contested publicly, then it would be. This is me guessing why he's not yeah. contesting it publicly because all I had to not go even on was you're a fucking cunt. <laughs> not you even know? explaining why doing this is going to lead to something good. That that's yeah. that's something he's ideologically opposed to. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know. My my gut reaction would be that if you want people to do something, it would be good for them to know what it's going to achieve like, and how it's going to achieve it. I mean, I think so. I think that one way to answer that question that I think the book is 
instructive, um, or at least the, the events in the book are instructive um, in speaking to, is that you can imagine a situation in which every single tactic is used for good or evil. Like there is, I think, a moment in which there is nothing that like is ontologically progressive about any particular tactic. You can think of a situation in which storming the capital of a country, occupying the the the, the, the centers of power, and then seizing, you know, and then like smashing everything up is going to be part of a transformative project would make the country better. You can also think of a way in which that's quite a bad thing to do or the it's wrong really people. It's really sick when the fishwives did it in Versailles. <laughs> like that was great. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, in 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 ultimately in the US and in Brazil, you get like there are different types of people storming the capital for their own reasons. And I think you can also come up with a lot of ways to imagine that getting yourself arrested even acts of what might be called like um, sabotage or terrorism or violence. Like everybody, everybody, liberal, conservative, left, leftist, monarchist, can imagine a situation in which violence and sabotage and destruction of public property are justified. It's just like, what situation are we in now? What is the thing that's going to happen after this thing that I do, which is going to make society better? Because you can imagine um, a set of radical actions to impose costs on companies which are destroying the environment which simply look, impose costs for them, make it harder for them to do business and make them less likely to destroy the environment. You could also imagine a set of actions which are taken advantage of, which is used as an excuse by people that are in charge of the communications apparatus that choose to represent what's happening in a specific way or choose to uh, respond to a, a particular uh, set of actions, which would have been called like adventurist in the old, like old left canon. Um, in a way which ultimately is counterproductive. So like for me, it's just like, it's, it seems like stupid and like it's I'm <laughs> avoiding the question, but I think it's just like a lesson that everybody knew, but we kind of forgot in the era of sort of techno op optimism and this belief that the internet was going to solve everything, that you have to be very, very close attention to conditions. What is the actual configuration of power in, that you're act acting upon? And how is the way you're acting going to make things better? Because I could imagine everybody in getting arrested working out really great for saving the planet or not, depending on who does and how you do it and, and who takes advantage of the situation. I mean, I guess my my f my final question is one about leadership, right. right? I think that in the time that I've been on the left, we've often been really squeamish about leadership. We've both wanted it and I think kind of flock to it when we see it, but there's always the sense of betrayal is imminent at any moment mm -hmm. and you're you're gonna screw me over and and the ideal conditions would be leaderlessness. I mean, how would you advise people to think about leadership? How can you be not so scared of it, but also um not so passive in the face of it that you just end up going along with any old thing, whether or not it's strategic, effective, yeah. or leading you to the promised land. Yeah, I think you can be scared of it. I think that the the fear that inspires a certain part of the left to take a, a a move away from leadership, a move towards structurelessness, or at least the attempt at structurelessness, because we can talk about it, whether or not that actually ever happens, um, comes from a real fear of what happens when a tightly organized, hierarchically uh, uh, um, um, structured group gains power and then does bad things. Because bad leaders do exist. There are organizations that become sort of tyrannical. This is a real risk. And again, I'm going back to Rodrigo Nunes here because like I'm, I, I might as well admit that I'm taking it from him. But at the end of his book, he says that like a lot of the left, the anti-authoritarian left, was sort of stung so deeply by the, the trauma of the 20th century, by the perceived failures of the Soviet Union, that they began to see any type of organization as the slippery slope to the gulag. Like anytime you did anything that could actually effectively change society, you were at risk of making things worse than they already are, which is true, you are. If you do if you use the tools which actually work there is the chance that you might actually become worse than the people that you're combating that 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 chance exists but what he also says is that if you refuse to use the tools that work organization and you know that doesn't mean necessarily a leader but some kind of an organization then you're abdicating responsibility to the people that will use those tools you're saying not on me, I'm gonna stay pure over here. And somebody else, and this is what happened very, very often in the 2010s, somebody else that is not shy about using the tools that really work is gonna come in, seize the opportunity and move things uh, in their direction. And, and so that is what comes up in this history. I can imagine a different set of 
episodes in a different decade where this 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 package of um, contention, this like recipe of response to injustice might work better. But in this case, this is what happens often off, over and over. The people that are not squeamish about organized goals oriented activity often tragically steal the thunder from the people that do not want to get involved in that kind of stuff. And this goes back to the, that essay, I think, I don't know, I, that I, I definitely mentioned in the book, I don't know if we talked about already in this interview, The Tyranny of Structurelessness. That like, it's a really great essay, it's like two pages, but this feminist theorist back in the 70s says that a after, you know, years and years and years of trying to create leaderless or leaderful or structureless feminist organizing, she came to the conclusion that if you don't choose what the structure is, the structure will be imposed on you, and it's often going to be the structure that you did not, that you would not have chosen. So, given that you're, you know, in a large enough group of people, given that there's probably going to be some type of organization, some organization is going to appear, um, you might as well be in charge of deciding what it is. Seems like quite sage advice to end on. Vincent Bevins, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me.